Welcome to People Love Process. When you offer creative services, you never know what type of project you might be approached to work on or who you'll be working with. Some projects can be kind of intimidating because you may have never worked on that type of project before, but that's usually where you can grow and learn new skills. Now, other projects will come your way and they're well within your wheelhouse of skills. Those are easy ones to approach and move forward on. Now, client personalities and expectations are always in flux and all over the map. Just this last week, I had one client thanking me for giving him advice on a pitch we'll be giving to the city council regarding the development he's building that I branded for him. Yet, in the same week, another client who I consulted with and initially agreed with my suggestions, now thinks I shouldn't have talked him out of his bad idea, and after 10 solid design directions, he still can't make up his mind. The moral of this design story, focus on the clients who appreciate what you do and try to avoid the grinders. That's the reality of being a creative. In this movie, I'll showcase an event graphic, how I approached it, and the various methods I used to create my final design, and of course, how the client reacted to it. Now, the design you see in front of you is a poster, and I was approached in 2006, so this dates it obviously, um, by the marketing director for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is located in Cleveland, Ohio. And every year they do this event called Summer in the City, and they invite all these bands in, and they uh, wanted a poster for that year's event. And so they hired me to create this poster. At that time, I was doing a lot of this tribal kind of tattoo looking style. And that's what they requested. This was the design I did. It was printed on really nice uncoated stock. And uh, it just came out pretty cool looking. But that was a lot of fun to work with. And the person I work with, the marketing director, uh, was really easy to work with and enjoyable. Now, about five years after this, um, I was contacted again by that marketing director, but she had already moved on and was now a marketing director for Lorain County and their tourism board. And so she hired me to create uh, the branding for uh, that entity she is working with. And this is what I had come up with. Now, anytime I look at old artwork like this, I scrutinize it because sometimes I'll look at it and I still like it and that's that. Other times I'll look at it and I'll go, why did I use three different fonts on this design? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do that now. So all of us grow and learn and improve. Um, I'm no exception to that. And I look at the subtext down below that says Lake Erie is, our, is in our nature. And I would have not used a third font there. Um, I even probably might not even use the typeface I chose for Lorain County now. Um, but it's not horrible. It's just you learn to to get better and things not to do and never use three typefaces. Uh, that's a no-no. Uh, but the iconography, I still love it. I still think it works great. I create a whole series that uh, cover all the various things you can do in uh, Lorain County. So that was a lot of fun. Well, she contacted me after I did this. It was a few more years past that. Uh, she contacted me and said, hey, we do, we've been doing an event for a long time. It's called Waist High and Walleye. It's a fishing event we do every year. Uh, but the graphics and the marketing material we, we have is just so dated. It was created in the late 70s, early 80s. And this is one image she showed me. And I go, yeah, it looks a bit dated. And I go, what's up with the belt buckle? She goes, well, one year we actually did belt buckles and people could buy them. I go, how was that? How'd that go? And she said, it was kind of expensive. And I go, yeah, it sounds expensive, uh, but it's definitely dated. So she wanted me to brand the event so that they would have a better way to market themselves and the event 
and engage with those who would want to participate in the event. Well, that's what I love to do. That was my creative challenge. Uh, my process always starts with drawing. And yes, I still draw an analog. I still use a pencil. Um, if you've watched any of my content on People Love Process, you probably realize that now. But I've also mentioned and showed in several movies uh, that my daughter, who works with me from time to time on various projects, uh, she does all of her drawing on her iPad Pro. So she's fully digital. She loves it. Um, uh, not that she never draws in a sketchbook. She does that too. But almost everything she's doing on her iPad Pro. So drawing, it doesn't matter if you use analog or you use digital, like an iPad Pro or any other type of device like that. Um, drawing is drawing. You're always going to get better. So every project that I work on, I do what's called thumbnail drawing. Here's thumbnail drawings of different designs I was kind of thinking through for this project. Now, I'm thinking it has to say waist high and walleye, but I was thinking, you know, we might add a subtext in here. You know, maybe we'll put you know, Lorraine County or whatever. So I wasn't really sure about all the details of the text, but I knew it had to say waist high and walleye. And so I just start trying to figure it out. I'm not worrying about a walleye is a specific breed of fish. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. So these are just thumbnails. I don't care about proportion or if it looks like it at this point. It's all about capturing the essence in of an idea. Uh, this one's not so bad, kind of traditional almost a, a t-shirt type of format, if you will. This one, I don't know what I was thinking, like the fish catching itself, I guess. I don't think that's that's uh, too great. It's kind of funny, but uh, yeah, that, that I, you have to work through your bad ideas to get to the good ideas. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, tried other ones, but the thing I found hard is fishing is all about using a fishing pole. Fishing poles are long and thin, and unless you handle it like I did in the middle bottom here where I kind of cross them almost like swords. And then I thought, well, maybe I could turn that, you know, the, the fishing line in, to form an ornate kind of, I don't know, border treatment of sorts. And it's not that it's a bad idea. It's just, I'm like, uh, once again, that's more feels like just something you'd see on a t-shirt, not really a branding for an event. Uh, so I didn't, I, I just thought it was a little too complicated. So I, I went and tried other things, but I kept running into the problem with the fishing pole. And I go, Ugh, that's that, I'm not sure how I'm going to, how I'm going to solve this. You know, I tried it, bending it and wrapping type. That's okay. This one, I couldn't get the buckle out of my head. So I put them in pants. <laughs> this one, I knew there's no chance that this would ever be used. I just did this to entertain myself. So yes, I do that. I'm going, well, maybe we show like the participant, but I don't want to show a person. So I just took a tackle box and personified it, made it look like it's smiling. Yeah, I mean, it's cute, but I think it's too juvenile for an event that pretty much mostly adults do. I'm sure there's kids that participate in it, but uh, for the most part, it's for adults and it needs to be a certain level of sophistication. So I thought we were departing uh, the subject matter going that way. And so the more I thought about a fishing pole, I kept thinking it's so long and thin. It's like a long line. How do I deal with that? And then it hit me. I go, well, that's it. It's a long line. And so I drew this. And as soon as I drew this, I go, that's it. I'll turn this into a badge type of design and the perimeter will just be the fishing reel, but I'm not going to worry about keeping it straight. We're just going to wrap it in a circular motif and it will encapsulate everything, which is nice. It'll work as a badge. Now, again, this is a thumbnail sketch. This isn't exactly what a, a, a walleye kind of looks like, even though I had looked it up and I saw what they look like. Um, I need to draw this in a more iconic fashion, more uh, simplified, but this is the idea that I captured and I moved from here. And so we're going to build out this idea and I'm going to show you how I did it. Now, before I jump in and show you the specific tools, I should state when I created this, 
there was a lot of functionality that's now in Illustrator that wasn't in Illustrator there. For example, we're going to be using the shape building tool for some of this. We're also be uh, we're going to be using the tool right above it, which is the width tool. Um, both of those did not exist at the time I built this originally. So how did I create it originally? Well, I did a lot of eyeballing. Now, thankfully, a circular shape is arguably the easiest shape to work with in Illustrator. Uh, so it wasn't too hard, but it certainly isn't as easy as I'm going to show you here. So I always use throwaway shapes. So these shapes are just to define the area we want to keep of the circle, which is this area right here. So I'll select both of these. We'll go to the shape tool and with the shape tool, it'll default to the plus cursor. That means it's going to add to whatever shape you have selected. We're going to hold option down to get it negative. And what I want to do is remove. It'll highlight the path we're, we're hovering over red and it means this is going to disappear. That's what I want. I'll click on it. Uh, just to make that disappear. Now the throwaway part, this I'll just delete. All we wanted was this part here. So this is going to become the handle of the reel itself. Now the size I'm building it at in this file is a bit larger. And I did that just so it's easier and it looks better uh, viewing quality for you watching this. Um, if I would have done it at um, the original size, I always use whole numbers. So I'm going to be punching in some non-whole numbers because I resized it. So here I might have originally done like 12 thickness or whatever. Maybe it's probably around 15, I'm guessing, something like that. And I always do a whole number. I don't go 15.357. I mean, who does that? Nobody does that. Well, I'm going to do that now because when I resized it, it changed the actual dimensions. In this one, I might have gone 19, but I'd never go 19.117. But that's what we are going to use here. So it visually looks the way I want it to. So that'll be the handle. Let's go back to the layers here. We'll turn on this layer. And again, this is the throwaway shape. The same copy, the same diameter of the, the original circle we did previously. And on these, we'll select these two shapes. I'll go back to the shape tool like this, and I don't need this part. So I'll hold option down, get rid of that. Now that we've done that, we can get rid of the shape we used to edit it. And this is gonna become the rod portion of the fishing reel or the, the fishing pole that is. And this is the part that's usually, it's, I think it's plexiglass uh, that bends and stuff, you know, without snapping. Um, sometimes I'm surprised how much they can bend and they don't, you know, break in two. Uh, so we're going to set this. And what I want to do initially is I want to set the overall thickness to 10.5 points like that. So as it's coming out of the fishing pole, it's thick. But down here... A fishing pole tapers. It goes from thick where it comes out of the handle. And by the time it gets to the tip, it's really thin. And so we want to mimic that. So how would I have done this back in the day before I had uh, the width tool? Well, I'd have to manually do it and eyeball it. That's how I did it. Uh, I'll show you a way easier way. We'll just zoom in on the in tip here. We're going to go to the um, width tool here. And if you've never used the width tool, wherever you can select any place on a path. In this case, we're going to go right to the end. And you can see I can just pull it out and it's giving you the readout right to the right of, okay, how thick this is. And I want to go to about, I don't know, five or so. So maybe we go right about there. And what that does, it's tapering the end of that path we just created to that thickness, which is around 4.7, but it starts at 10.5. So that's really cool. And that's all we want to do. Now, the next thing I want to do is I just want to go ahead and add a round cap here because that looks better like that. And now we'll do the next one. Let's go back to layers. We'll turn on the next one. This is going to be the fishing line or the leader, if you're a, uh, if you want to use the correct term for fishing. 
and uh, we're going to go ahead and go back to the shape building tool. I want just this part, so we'll hold option down and just get rid of everything else. Get rid of the shape we use to edit it. This one, I think this is one point. Yeah, we'll bump this up to two. And that's gonna act as the fishing line on the end of our pole. So once I get to this point, I have to add the reel in. Now this is where I'll use a uh, reference. So I just pulled up this reference to see what a reel actually looks like. And then I wanna simplify it down to more simplistic iconic forms and shapes. And so I created this. So instead of this going this way, I have it as if it's turned and it's like this, just to simplify it. I didn't want to get over complicated and distract uh, the in graphic visually. So this is what I simplified it down to. And all we're going to do, it's easier to build a shape in a 90 degree um, angle because it's more geometric. If you try to do it at an angle or a, a, a skewed view, it's a lot harder because you can't, you can't build shapes really fast that way because it's at an odd an angle. So I created this at 90 degrees. So I have it set at a three o'clock position based off of the overall circular shape that we're working from. This is just a larger copy on the outside of that. And I do that because it's easy to position it 90 degrees where I want it in terms of how far it's gonna eat into the edge of uh, the handle shape. I'll select this, select the circle, and as soon as I have that, it's gonna go off of the circle. So I can just slide it up where I think it looks good proportionally like that. Now, this is somewhat like a baking show. We're gonna bring up rotate if you don't wanna do it manually. And in this case, the rotation we're gonna use is again an odd number um, like that. And then you can preview it and it will go into that position. That's fine. Again, uh, this shape was for no other reason than to compose the other one. So we can delete that. And now we have the reel in the, the right position. Now it's at this point, I also added the lure and the hook just to add that nice little detail in there. Uh, both of these are just filled shapes, but you can see these are still um, outlined. So we need to expand these. So I'm gonna select the line, the rod and the handle, and we'll go up to object, we'll go to path, and we're gonna go outline stroke like that. And if I select this, you can see now it's just a fill. It's not a stroke. And this is a fill, not a stroke. This is a fill and not a stroke like that. And that's what we want. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to zoom in because we need to do a little bit of detailing on the handle. And once again, you can use um, Illustrator's corner widget. So if you select a corner, you can go in and round these because that's what I wanna do on this shape. So if you wanna use the corner widget, you can. Um, I just rarely use the corner widget. I usually use a plugin called um, uh, Dynamic Corners because it existed like six years before Illustrator ripped off the feature and <laughs> poorly implemented it themselves. Uh, and and I, I am telling the truth, that is what happened, so don't get mad at me. Uh, we're gonna go to about oh, maybe a little over three or something like that. The thing, the reason why I use the plugin, I can do one. Once I establish this radius, I want all, each of these corners to be the same radius. Now, if you're using the corner widget, let's go ahead and undo this. Um, you can grab the shape and all at one time you can use that. So if you want to use a corner widget, you can. It's I'm not saying you, you can't do this natively. You can. Um, I just don't like it. Now, here's why I don't use it. It's because at times it's still not going to help you. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at the bottom left. This isn't rounding. Why isn't it? Well, we're going to undo what we just did. And I'm going to go back to the corner widget and we're going to go ahead and establish these. And once I establish one, I can just click the next one and it'll apply the same. But when I get here, notice it's not doing it. It's not saying it can round it. Well, why is that? Well, we're going to zoom in because in Illustrator, when you build, 
if you have an anchor point that's this close to a corner, guess what? It will only round as far as that other anchor point is. It can't go beyond it. It blocks it. So how do you resolve that? Well, natively in Illustrator, if I remove this anchor point, notice we have a curve. You can see the handle stretched way out here. <laughs> I should just zoom out because uh, it's going up pretty far. So you can see the handle going up here. If I remove that anchor point, using the feature in Illustrator, which is remove anchor point here, and I click that in the control bar, it's going to screw up the art. So you don't want to do that. So how do you do that? Well, there is no way natively you'd have to monkey around with this to find a workaround. And that's why I use plugins, because I can select that anchor we don't want. I can go to the Pathscribe panel, part of Astute Graphics Vector Scribe plugin, and I can click on Smart Remove. It removes it without destroying my art. Uh, why Illustrator can't add that type of functionality is beyond me. It's ironically on the Illustrator Lite on the iPad, and I call it Lite because it's not full-blown Illustrator, uh, but it's not on the desktop, so whatever. So we're going to add that round there. And I just think that looks more genuine in terms of real. And it's at this point, I would just select all these elements. So everything here. And then I would just go to the Pathfinder and go Unite. So now it's one unified shape that's going to work great. Let's take a look at the fish, the specific breed of fish uh, that we're going to be working on, which is the walleye. Now, if I turn this on here, you can see uh, th they're not super huge. Although when I was looking at fish online, I saw some really big ones. They get pretty big too. Um, but um, I need something more idealistic. So this is where I found a historic uh, kind of diagram illustration of a walleye. But this is too realistic. I want to kind of iconify it. I want to simplify it. And so this is where I'll draw on top of it just to figure out how to simplify it. And this wasn't so bad, but even after I started building it, I go, it needs to be more geometric. I, uh, this is too curved. It needs some straights in there and it just needs some really basic geometry to, to make it look iconic, not like a, a realistic, um, flat graphic of a fish if i don't even know if that describes it the way i'm trying to and so it went from this and as i built it out i just kept it as flat art as shown here so wh why did i do that well because it's easier to create shapes and then combine them and edit other shapes so let's go and zoom in on this a little bit so you can see this better if i select the fish body it's just a fill of black with a white outline. Now, if I remove that white outline right now, I think it's a one stroke. Oh, it's one point. Let's go ahead and copy that. So if I remove that white, this is what it looked like. That doesn't look bad, but I think having that gap in between uh, looks better and it actually simplifies it. It doesn't look as complicated. Now, these are just... Um, uh, shapes that I've gone ahead and copied to create a pattern of sorts. And if we go up here and I pull this out, let's go ahead and color it right now. It's white. All this is is sitting on top of that fin. So if we put it back and I select these two shapes, I can go to Pathfinder and go minus front, and it's just going to cookie cutter through that. And that's going to create uh, that fin. I don't know what they call that. I know this is the dorsal fin. I'm not sure what they call these. Um, but if you look at the real world reference, it'll give you uh, cues on what to do with certain detail. Their fins on their tail, on their bottom are pretty lin linear in terms of having these lines that run through them. Uh, the dorsal fin, a little more spaced out. So that's why I did that. And then we did the same approach on, once again, I don't remember what type of fin they call those, but on the side of its head and then all the other detail to make up its face, et cetera. Some of these are just pieces. This is just a piece to create that fish lip look um, on his mouth. So 
The next thing I want to show you is obviously I want to indicate some scales, but a fish is completely covered. So I don't want to overdo it because then it'll get too complex. So we're going to do some simple scaling and I'm going to move this down like this. This is the area I want to define. Now I'm going to zoom in on this because I want to show you how easy it is to create a pattern. So this is just a grid here of 16 squares. Now the gap in between these squares, if we go here and I snap it, and I have Smart Guides turned on, Command U, so it will snap to the edge. And let's go ahead and color that this color. I have a no fill, no stroke. If you look at the swatches here, no fill, no stroke, bounding box, grouped with the squares. Why did I do that? Because we're going to create a pattern. Everywhere around the squares is the same thickness. Now this thickness, the tolerance, if I bring this over here, is half the gap in between. So when I create a pattern, it'll make the pattern the same gap between this art and the next uh, iteration of it that is made by a pattern. So if I drag this over, you can see you can't see anything because the background's white and there's no fill or stroke on that. All we're going to do, all you have to do here, drag and drop, you're done. You don't even have to go and double click into the pattern swatch, into the pattern tool. We have everything we need now. We can get rid of that. Let's zoom out. And I did that because I'm going to, let's zoom in on this so you can see us better. All I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and select this area that I'm going to define as the scales. Make sure you're on fill and fill it with that pattern. We don't want the outline. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And this is how I'm going to handle the scales. Now, when I did this, the thing I didn't like is I didn't like that they were squares. I didn't think that looked right. And so the more, and sometimes I'll just sit like this and stare at it until I figure out what's bugging me. And what's bugging me here is these little slivers you can see, these little shapes that are left over as it flows within the shape. And I didn't like that. But then I thought, you know what? I can't leave it like squares. If I select this shape and I go to the rotate tool and double click it, make sure to turn off transform object so it doesn't move the object but it transforms the inner pattern, the transform pattern. It's gonna use the same angle we did on rotating the reel, but I'm gonna punch in 45 and hit preview. And I think that looks a lot better having it as diamond shapes. It reads kind of like, their scales are pretty small on a walleye, so it reads well as scales, but it looks more dynamic, but I still don't like these little artifacts that are left over because this is essentially just flowing a pattern within a shape and that shape edge is hard edge. So you're gonna get those little um, artifacts if you used it like this. And so I was thinking, so how do I do this? I, I'm not sure how to do this. Well, I'm gonna show you how I solved it. And that is, I just use the shape we originally had to guide me and then once I had that rotated into a 45 degree angle, I just expanded it and then use the guide of the shape that I had filled with a pattern and use that to guide me in knowing which ones to leave and which ones to move out. So I just left this line in here to show you that. So let's go ahead and just delete that. And this is what I ended up with. And then I thought of this idea, this zigzag, and I go, wow, I really like that. So I liked how that added it. I even put a few down here to indicate scales because it isn't just on one side. And uh, this is how I solved that problem. I just wanted to show you that because it's easy to just go over that thing and, and not really pay any attention to it, but it's that kind of detail you need to pay attention to as you're working. Now, of course, these are still strokes. These are still uh, shapes that are just sitting on top and other ones kind of uh, oriented behind this shape, which has a stroke on it. So you'll want to build it out clean, meaning you're going to have to expand things and use Pathfinder to punch through like we did on this. But notice even this one, 
isn't uh, isn't cleaned up all the way because it's just sitting behind the base shape of the fish. So that's where it just takes time to go through and build it out clean. So what you end up with is final art that looks like this. And if I go, let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. If I go into key line mode, which is command Y, you can see that we're using no strokes. It's all filled shapes. And that's what you want because that's going to make it easier to use. In this case, it's black. We're going to use one of the brand colors for Lorain County, this green. We'll color it green. Here's our fishing pole. Here's some of the initial type I did. And uh, I just wanted to briefly show you this because uh, you might have wondered how I created uh, the type on the top and that's what I want to go through next. So let's choose the typeface we want to use um, So we're going to go ahead and open up this panel, which is for editing type. We'll go here We're going to be using uh, the type on path here like that And all we're going to do is right here I have this circle and I just cut these two in half So the bottom one is how I wrap that we're going to go ahead and wrap a uh, type on the top here. So with that selected and the type on path tool selected, we'll just go ahead and click right on this anchor and with smart guides, command U turned on and we'll wrap some type there. It'll Greek it out. This isn't the typeface we're going to use. Uh, we're actually going to use, I think I need to scroll all the way down because it's trade Gothic LT bold like that so we'll go ahead and click that and this is oops this had the one thing i should point out type controls in illustrator are completely wonky and uh, like seriously they're not too great at all um, we want to make this a lot bigger actually so what we're going to do is bump up this size quite a bit by the way we need to change it to what it's going to be and that is, it's going to be all uppercase. We'll go waist high like that. Um, you have these controls here, which allow you to push it this way. We're going to just bring it all the way over here until it snaps to that end. And this one all the way here until it snaps to that end. We'll go up to the top here. We're going to select center like that right now it's on a baseline so we want it to be centered on the top on the the path we have that we're wrapping it to so if we go over here to the type tool if you just double click it it'll bring this control up now if you don't know that shortcut you'd have to go to type you have to go down type on path you'd have to go type on path options and it bring up the same thing so a lot faster just to double click the type icon in the toolbar uh, right now it's baseline. We're going to go to center. That'll center that type on a path. This is the easiest way to do badges. So remember that. And right now it needs to be a lot bigger. Right now it's 24. We're going to go 60. Like that. I think that looks okay. We'll select it. It's obviously going to be this green color like that. But because we have this reel in, notice it's getting tight here. So I want to I want to control it so it's working better. And um, so I think center won't be the thing I want to do. I think I want to go flush left and then I'll go down to this controller here and I'll move this up because I want the base of the W to be right about, I don't know, right about there. And that looks pretty good. Now, if you want a kern, because when you wrap type on a curve, it doesn't always look great. Um, I think we can make some adjustments here. So that's what I, I want to do here is I think this A is too far away from the W. So I'll click in. And if you hold option down and use the nudge keys left and right, uh, this is how you can adjust the kerning. And it's going to be whatever your setting is in your preference. And mine, I think, is set for one point. So I can go one, two to nudge it over that way like that. And then I'll go to the next gap. And you can move through it with the nudge key. But when you hold option down, it'll use that nudge to either add or, or detract. And so what we want to do is we want to, on this one, I want to add a space here. So... 
I'm going to nudge it like that. And then we'll go to the part between the S and the T. I think this is a little too big, and we'll kind of bring that back a bit like that. And this is all you're going to do as you go through. And uh, kerning, you only get better at it the more you do it and the more you look at letter forms and figure out, does that look as good as it can? Because at times, um, things, especially newer fonts, I've noticed, the old classics tend to be better. Uh, they're called uh, kerning pairs between letter forms. Um, the newer ones, boy, some of the developers get really sloppy and it could be done a lot better. I think we want this one to be a little further, kind of like that. So that's how I would control the kerning. And I purposely, I wouldn't want to bring this H all the way down to the same baseline as the W because then it's too close to the real. So I'm trying to keep a nice kind of um, airy space in between those. Now, obviously, once I get it to this point, this is where um, I will go ahead and just outline the type. So if we want to do that, we'll just go. Now, I'm kind of spoiled on my workstation. I have what's called a stream deck made by Elgato, and it has all these buttons that I pre-program. And one of them I've been using so much, I forgot the command I used to know and use for 20 years for outline type. So in this case, we're going to do it the old fashioned way. We're going to go back down from type to create outlines and I'm going to outline it. So that's how I would get that all worked out like that. So ultimately the final design has everything in place like this. And this is where um, I presented it to the marketing director for Lorain County. And I was all excited about this. And she looked at it and she's going, I'm not sure that's going to work. And I'm like, what? I'm like, and so I felt obligated. I had to convince her it's going to work. But I had to do that in a way where she understood the potential it had. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty easy thing to do. So I just showed her that not only does this work in one color, which is very inexpensive for a promotion, especially for marketing, it makes it a lot more effective. You can spend your money on more merchandise, for example, rather than manufacturing and producing your logo in all the various contexts. But this works great on dark, on a white color, but it's gonna work great and it's gonna be very flexible on uh, your brand color. You could go white on a green background, or it could be your blue branded color, or it could even be the gold branded color you use. It's very flexible to use. You can use it on red and you can print merchandise, t-shirts. It's unlimited what you can do with it. You could sell these t-shirts and because we didn't uh, embed into the design a date, I never suggest clients doing that because if they do things like t-shirts, let's say they order like 200 dozen shirts, but they only sell through 150 dozen. Well, they have 50 dozen of shirts. And if it's branded with a date, they're instantly like, well, who's going to buy them if it has a date on it? But if it doesn't have a date, they can just reuse those next year. And it makes the costs go down. So it's more effective that way. And this is going to work great in an event t-shirt. I explained that she can use this in promotion and advertising. So in that case, it'll work great. Here, I just dropped it on a, on a background photo. Now at times, sometimes the photo might not be this dark, in which case this is where I'll grab uh, the eyedropper tool over here and I'll sample a color from the background. Here, I think I'm gonna sample this darker brown. So we'll just sample it. It creates a swatch there. Now. In the previous movie I did on people of, I forgot to write down the the command because to create a global swatch, you can drag it into the swatches palette. I could do this and double click it and then click um, uh, global swatch. But if you remember the key commands, which I totally forgot in the last movie, which is command shift, and I can drag it into the palette and it creates that global swatch automatically. So that's what you want to do. Just Remember, command, shift, drag, global swatch is instantly created because I will take um, this image like this 
and then I will go to effect. I'll go down to stylize and I'll go to outer glow. It's going to bring this up. I'm going to select multiply. I'm going to go ahead and select that global swatch color we created here based derived from the background. I'm going to click it like that. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the opacity. I think this is too dark. We're going to go 35. And then I think it's a little too big on the blur. We'll go three. And then we're going to go OK. And if I deselect that now, you can see it's a subtle glow on it, but it helps the contrast read really well. So that's just a simple thing I do. I also told her, look, not only can you merchandise this on T-shirts, you can do stickers. So they could be stickers they could put on everything. Let's say it's their tackle box. Or you could take the design and do a decal. Now, I always show decal type of designs that are one color on a gray, dark gray background because they, they're usually put on vehicles. Sometimes they might put it on a window of a building, too. I guess if it's like a bait shop, they might do that. Um, but windows read is dark. A lot of people think they're clear. They're not. If you apply a vinyl sticker, it's going to read as a dark background. Might not be really dark, but it still works really effectively. So this is how I try to con convince clients like that. Well, as soon as I showed her all the different ways they could use it in marketing, use it in merchandising, uh, she bought into it. And, and I said, trust me, you're not going to regret this. And thankfully, it's become their most popular marketing graphic ever uh, that they've used. And that's awesome. They're still using it to this day. So um, it's great building a working relationship with good marketing directors. I say good because many marketing directors like to play art director. And if you've worked for a big company, you've probably experienced that before. And quickly they become serial design killers is <laughs> something we coined the phrase of when I used to work at Upper Deck because there's a few marketing directors there who just made almost every project a train wreck. But uh, the good ones understand the value you can bring in solving their marketing problems. So once you find them, just cherish them. And if you can help make their jobs easier, guess who they're going to be contacting the next time they need creative services? That's right. They're going to be contacting you. So I'd like to thank John Hasselon uh, for becoming our latest member of People of Process. This helps me dedicate the time necessary to create the content uh, for this channel. If you become a member, you get a lot of perks and memberships only content that I share via YouTube and uh, via private posts with members only. Uh, regardless if you become a member or not, I'd appreciate you sharing a link to my YouTube channel with someone you think would like this type of content. And make sure to like and subscribe as well. Thank you for watching People of Process. I really do appreciate it. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.